When talking about space, more likely than not, people will talk about interstellar travel. The concept that has been engraved in pop culture with so many sci-fi movies and stories out there, too many to count in fact, but can those blistering speeds be achieved in real life? We've come across a fair share of scientific concepts that could support interstellar travel, some of them plausible, while the others not so much. Can light speed be achieved? Will we get to see it in our lifetimes, or is it just another fictional tale only meant for dreams? Here's the thing about interstellar travel, we have a big, big problem. Space is far too long and wide for regular propulsion techniques to ever work. Take for example our nearest star system, that's about four light years away, Proxima Centauri. With the kind of technology we currently have, we'll take around 73,000 years to reach. Yep, you heard that right, 73,000 years. Even a distance that's seemingly as close as Mars could take up to a year, and that's literally the very next planet to ours. Space is a really, really big place. Even when traveling at the maximum speed the universe allows, it would take us forever to reach some of the glorious sights we've come to capture on our telescopes. Interestingly, a recently prospective drive is finding solutions to these big concerns. NASA engineer David Burns has been doing exactly that in his spare time. He's produced an engine concept that he says could theoretically accelerate to 99% the speed of light and, most inquiringly, all without using propellants. Burns posted it to the NASA Technical Reports server under the heading Helical Engine and, on paper, it works by exploiting the way mass can change at relativistic speeds those close to the speed of light in a vacuum. Some reports have even given the engine headlines claiming it could violate the law of physics. Now, that's some pretty unheard of stuff right there. The downside of this is that, while the concept is fascinating, it's definitely not going to break physics anytime soon. Using a thought experiment to explain his concept, Burns describes a box with a weight inside, threaded on a line with a spring at each end bouncing the weight back and forth. In a vacuum, such as space, the effect of this would be to wiggle the entire box with the weight seeming to stand still. Overall, the box would stay wiggling in the same spot, but if the mass of the weight were to increase in only one direction, it would generate a greater push in that direction and eventually thrust. I know what you folks are thinking about, right? It's not one of those shake weights that you've seen on TV a hundred times over, although I can see the similarities. Now, according to the principle of the conservation of momentum, in which the momentum of a system remains constant in the absence of any external forces, this should not be completely possible. The thing about this, though, is that there's a special relativity loophole. According to special relativity, objects gain mass as they approach light speed. So if you replace the weight with ions and the box with a loop, you can theoretically have the ions moving faster on one end of the loop and slower at the other. Burns drive isn't a single closed loop, it's helical, like a stretched out spring. He wrote in his theoretical, the engine accelerates ions confined to a loop to moderate relativistic speeds and then varies their velocity to make slight changes to their mass. The engine then moves ions back and forth along the direction of travel to produce thrust. The engine has no moving parts other than ions traveling in a vacuum line, trapped inside electric and magnetic fields. On paper, that sounds pretty darn neat, right? But it's not without significant practical problems. In a report by New Scientist, it says that the helical chamber would have to be pretty large, around 200 meters or 656 feet long and 12 meters or 40 feet in diameter to be accurate. Apart from that, it would need to generate 165 megawatts of energy to produce one newton of thrust. That's the equivalent of a power station to produce the force required to accelerate a kilogram of mass per second squared. So, a lot of input for an almost negligible output. It is terribly inefficient. What about in the vacuum of space, you ask? Well, it might just work. Burns said the engine itself would be able to get to 99% the speed of light if you had enough time and power. 
The dream, maybe not all of us, but still more than a few, is the desperate want to go into interstellar space. Factually speaking, we may never get there, but if we never even try to think about it, we'll definitely not be able to. Just like that Coldplay song, but if you never try, you'll never know. Burns notes the efficiency problem in his presentation and also adds that his work hasn't been reviewed by experts and there may be errors in his math. The blueprints for a fully functional space travel engine might not exist as yet, but the theoretical output can be given some thought. What we do have is a piece of groundwork that could be used to develop such an engine. While this might not be the best way to look at interstellar travel, another, more plausible method, which already sort of exists, is actively being researched. A cutting-edge nuclear thermal propulsion or NTP rocket engine using what's called centrifugal liquid fuel bubble through could be the way forward for NASA to go directly into deep space. NASA has made substantial developments in a solid fuel NTP design. The bubble through concept under study by the university collaborators is one of three proposed hydrogen based designs for a next generation liquid fueled NTP rocket. This bubble through centrifugal NTP concept heats hydrogen gas propellant to super hot temperatures, but there is no combustion. Hydrogen is literally bubbled through a rotating liquid uranium core in the engine through a porous cylinder wall causing the gas to rapidly expand. As it exits the nozzle, the expanding hydrogen provides thrust for the spacecraft. That sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Dr. Dale Thomas, the project's principal investigator and an eminent scholar in systems engineering at UAH, says that the design significantly improves performance over conventional liquid fuel rocket engines that combust hydrogen and oxygen. He reveals, in conventional liquid fuel engine combustion, the resulting propellant molecules, H2O in the case of hydrogen and oxygen, are much heavier due to those relatively heavy oxygen atoms, and they will not exit the nozzle as fast, providing more thrust but less impulse. Thrust is the force supplied by the engine, for example, to lift a spacecraft away from Earth's gravity. Impulse is the change in momentum per unit of fuel, and that matters when it comes to getting a spacecraft where it's going in space. Dr. Thomas continues saying, Think of your car. Think of thrust as torque and impulse as miles per gallon or MPG. Both matter just like both torque and MPG matter in your car. Hotter, relatively lightweight hydrogen atoms will make the ship go farther. Dr. Thomas further explains, if we get the propellant hotter, it has more energy and will exit the nozzle faster, which provides more impulse. Since this is a higher performing engine, it has the potential to power spacecraft on trajectories other than the minimum energy trajectories, providing options for higher energy trajectories that will shorten the trip time to and from Mars and other destinations throughout the solar system. Although it's conceptually intriguing, the bubble-through engine has got its fair share of technical challenges, a major one being the development of material for its porous cylinder wall that can withstand direct contact with the molten uranium fuel. Basically, something really, really strong and has a high boiling point. Dr. Thomas reassures, saying, We're in the very early stages of this. This bubble-through concept has been around since the 60s. The physics are well understood, but the engineering challenges have precluded getting this concept off the drawing board in the past. We're attempting to see whether today's technologies will let us develop a viable liquid fuel NTP engine prototype. The centrifugal NTP engine research is led by Dr. Thomas for NASA to develop a spacecraft designed for use with solid fuel NTP engines. He reveals, we are conducting mission studies looking at what you can do with a solid fuel NTP propulsion system other than a crewed mission to Mars. Our work so far indicates that it will enable direct trajectories for uncrewed scientific missions to the outer planets in the solar system and perhaps even sample returns from the Jovian moons. Furthermore, 
With a direct trajectory, a spacecraft flies directly to a destination. The current chemical propulsion systems we have must rely on proper planetary alignments to be able to take advantage of gravity assists when flying by planets, which basically means we could use the gravity as a means to assist our travel. Dr. Thomas concludes saying, those planetary alignments only come around once every few years. With this liquid fuel NTP, you can perhaps even get to the Kuiper belt on a direct trajectory. That's going to be one heck of a ride, considering that the Kuiper belt starts at 4,400,000,000 kilometers from the sun. You'll need much more than a toothbrush for that journey. Now, we're currently not sure when we will get to see this technology being used in spacecraft, but we could possibly see it sooner rather than later. Compared to the helical engine, nuclear engines have been appreciated with more certainty as researchers are actively delving deeper into its concepts. For now, we just have to wait and watch as to which of the two actually makes it to fruition. So, what do you think? Which of the two is a more viable option? Will we really get to see a helical engine spacecraft anytime soon? And when do you think we'll be able to travel close to the speed of light? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching Space Age.